Good afternoon. Welcome to my home office and thanks for joining us for Chancellor's Associates first ever virtual colloquium. I'm Sandy Timmons, Chair of Chancellor's Associates, and it's a pleasure to have you here with us. I'm sorry we don't have the usual spread of wine and appetizers for you. We can't even shake hands or bump elbows, but I'm sure today's webinar will be just as edifying and enjoyable as our past events. In the face of this new reality, Chancellor's Associates is dedicated to continuing our programming and offering new ways for you to connect with campus. And we still be will be awarding Chancellor's Associate Scholarships to new students enrolling this fall. Our goal of sponsoring 800 Chancellor's Associates on campus each year is now even more important than ever. So this afternoon, we have a very topical subject. Our speaker will be breaking down for us how diseases like COVID-19 spread and what we can learn from similar cases in history. He will hopefully also shed some light on what the near future may have in store for us. So here to introduce our distinguished guest speaker is the Dean of the Division of Biological Sciences, Kit Pagliano. She will share with us some of the Dr. Stephen Kedrick's contributions to the UC San Diego Molecular Biology Department. Please welcome Dean Pagliano. Thank you, Sandy. And welcome everyone to this virtual colloquium. It's a great pleasure to be here this, with all of you this afternoon, virtually, um, in this strange new reality that we're in. It's my great pleasure to introduce Distinguished Professor of Molecular Biology, Stephen Hedrick, who is the holder of the Chancellor's Associates Endowed Chair in the Division of Biological Sciences. As this group well knows, um, holding the Chancellor's Associates Chair is an honor that we reserve only for our very top professors in the division. And Steve truly embodies all that we at UCSD hold uh, dear about, it, about our faculty. And that is he exemplifies excellence in research. He's a highly productive scientist who publishes about the mechanism by which the immune system um, helps defend the body of, against uh, predators and uh, infectious agents such as viruses and um, uh, bacteria. And in the evolutionary interplay between these, the immune system and the viruses. He is uh, an elected fellow in the American Academy of Immunology, which is a high, uh, a high um, achievement in his field. He's also exemplifies excellence in service. He's been uh, chair of the Department of Molecular Biology and has served on numerous campus committees and plays a leadership role as well in his research community, serving on the editorial board of top journals. And um, he's truly an exemplar of a dedicated faculty member who gives back both to the campus and to the community. He's also an outstanding instructor and he routinely receives 100% um, student approval in his courses with students commenting on how clearly and eloquently he explains complicated um, topics in biological sciences, especially about the immune system. And they also comment on his clear passion for the subject matter and his uh, clear joy of interacting with our undergraduate students and teaching them about the subject that he loves best, immunology. And so I know that you're going to greatly enjoy his presentation here this afternoon. And so please join me in welcoming distinguished professor Stephen Hedrick. And I hope you enjoy his talk. Thank you. Hello everyone. Thank you for tuning in. I especially wanna thank the Chancellor's Associates for supporting research at UC San Diego for many years. Now, everyone has access to a huge amount of information pertaining to the COVID epidemic. Some of it is accurate and some of it's not so accurate. So today I'd like to present two issues related to the COVID epidemic that you probably won't see discussed in the media. The first is why it is that we human beings are the most diseased species on earth. And the corollary to that, which is that human epidemics are inevitable. The second topic I want to discuss is a theory to explain the virulence of the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes the COVID-19 disease. 
So let me begin. All forms of life have multiple mechanisms of immunity that I've listed here in this uh, diagram. But only a small portion of the world's microbes and viruses are able to colonize human beings. And yet all organisms, including human beings, are parasitized by combinations of viruses, bacteria, fungi, such as pneumocystis or candida, protozoa, like those that cause malaria or giardia, intestinal flatworms, tapeworms, roundworms, um, and ectoparasites like fleas and ticks. So parasitism is a fundamental aspect of life. We are awash in microbes that uh, we harbor either as infectious diseases or as um, mutualistic organisms that occupy our skin and our mouth and our intestines and, and so on. We know that each and every living creature has evolved by natural selection. We're selected to avoid predation, starvation, exposure, and we're selected to enhance reproduction, care for offspring, and in the case of human beings, grand offspring, and group success, which is thought to be altruism, which is now accepted by the community of evolutionary biologists after a long period. But importantly, we're also evolved, we're co-evolved with the microbial or parasitic world. We're selected to resist using our mechanisms of immunity, or when resistance is futile, we tolerate infections. But here's the important part. Our parasitic infectious agents, viruses, etc., are selected to replicate in our bodies, but they also have to be selected to be transmitted to the next host. This is known as trade-off theory, and it means that infection is intrinsically self-limited. That is, Infectious agents are confronted with a paradigm. They want it, they are selected to replicate at very high levels in our body, but if they do so too successfully, they can't be transmitted to the next host because they may kill their host or immobilize their host before they can be transmitted. So each and every one of these infectious agents, especially viruses, are co-evolved with its host species. And an implication is that when a virus jumps from one species to another, it is unprepared for its new host. Its virulence is unpredictable. Nonetheless, every so often a virus can jump to a new species with unpredictable results. So here's some examples. There's a, a family of viruses known as arena viruses, and they infect murid species, which are mouse-like animals. And the most famous of which is Lassa virus. Now we know of 31 different arena viruses and seven of them, when they jump to human beings, cause a hemorrhagic fever, a fatal hemorrhagic fever. So this is the cause of Lassa fever. There's a hantavirus many people have heard of, which is a virus of rodents, found in the rodents in Curry Village in Yosemite sometimes. And it causes virtually no disease in rodents, but when it jumps to humans, once again, hemorrhagic fever. And of course, the one that everyone has heard of is Ebola virus. Ebola virus looks like it has a natural host as a fruit bat, but when it jumps to humans or other primates, it can cause a severe hemorrhagic fever and so on and so forth. There are many, many examples of viruses that cause little or no disease or pathology in their native species, but when they jump species, um, for instance, influenza is a bird virus. When it jumps to human beings, it can cause a lot of disease, 30 to 70,000 deaths a year. And of course, the famous one, which was the 1918 pandemic, which caused the death of at least 25 million people worldwide. And on and on, uh, rabies virus is another example where it causes virtually no disease in, in bats but when it uh, jumps to human beings, it's 100% lethal. Now, in the case of rabies virus, it can't be transmitted by from human to human, so it, it's dangerous for the human that gets it, but it's not dangerous for uh, human beings in general. And that brings us to coronaviruses. 
There are four coronaviruses that circulate in, human, in the human population that cause mild cold-like symptoms. But in the last 20 years, there have occurred three new viruses that have originated in bats and have jumped into the human population and cause everything from a mild to a fatal respiratory disease. So acquiring a viral disease from another species is a dangerous pop proposition. And especially for coronaviruses, it's not just dangerous for the individual that originally gets the disease. If it can be transmitted between human beings, it can lead to an epidemic or a pandemic. So it's dangerous for the entire human species. Now, how has this played out uh, throughout human history? And what you can see is this is a timeline of various uh, epidemics that have occurred since the dawn of history, starting with the plague of Athens, which during the Peloponnesian War killed 25% of the population of Athens over a period of four or five years. And on and on, there are many, there are many examples in the Middle Roman Empire during the Antoinon Plague, smallpox infected the population of the Roman Empire and led to, again, the uh, death of probably about 25% of the population of the Roman Empire. Almost certainly uh, was a major cause for the fall of the Roman Empire. And then you can move all the way up a few hundred years to the bubonic plague during the 14th century, which over a period of only four years um, killed off, 25, again, 25% of the population of Europe. Now, through all of this, there has been smallpox. It has originated since uh, history was recorded and probably throughout time, in, until there was a vaccine elimination of smallpox, it probably killed a billion people. Now, the one epidemic that's not really listed here in detail was probably the largest epidemic of all time. And that was when there was a European contact with the Western Hemisphere and Polynesia. And most historians at this point feel that starting in the 16th century, that contact resulted in epidemics that killed upwards of 50% of the population of the uh, Western Hemisphere. So our history is just littered with epidemics. And that's the reason I say that we are the most diseased species on earth. But why should this be? Why should it be that humans suffer so many epidemic diseases? And the point, the, um, I would like to make the point that this is probably inevitable and a result of civilization. So here is the population of the world over the last 12,000 years. And as you can see, uh, 12,000 years ago, there were uh, estimated to be only 4 million people on the entire earth. And that means that we lived in populations of small dispersed communities of hunter-gatherers, each consisting of a few hundred individuals. But then, because we're a clever species, we invented agriculture, which means the domestication of plants and animals. And that had two effects. One effect was that people could live in permanent communities at much higher densities. And the second effect was that at the same time as we domesticated animals, we sampled the infectious agents to be found in all the cows and sheep and goats and horses and birds. So we acquired multiple zoonotic infections in high density populations. And this meant that these infectious agents could evolve to very high virulence because they could be passed to a new host and still cause death and still find a new host. So we completely had changed our ecology over a very short period of time. We were no longer in an evolutionary balance with our infectious diseases. And of course, this is only uh, increased with time in the 20th century of course, we have expanded, the world's population has expanded exponentially such that we are adding a billion people every 12 years to the population. So what that means is if a zoonotic infection hits the human population, it can rapidly uh, expand. And because of modern transportation, it can go around the world in a, in a few days. So how can we look at this a little more closely um, and see it schematically? So let's look at a network diagram of small dispersed hunter-gatherers. These are 
groups of maybe a couple hundred people. And the dotted line indicates a potential interaction, but one that's not realized. So no contact usually between these dispersed groups. You can contrast that with rural communities where there are numbers of people living together, but they don't contact each other with high frequency, perhaps only occasionally. And finally, you could have huge population centers where, of course, people mingle on a daily basis. Now, if one infectious person or one an infection uh, lands in one of these communities, you can see what happens in this dispersed hunter-gatherers. Virtually nothing happens. It can go through one community and it, will, it would fade out after that. In rural towns, it might spread slowly, but, but in a limited fashion. But in huge population centers, it spreads almost infinitely. So that sort of illustrates how density can affect uh, the spread of disease. But what about the size of populations? Well, if a disease such as measles gets into a small population, it can rapidly spread through the population and infect uh, virtually all the people in the population and then run out of susceptible hosts. In that case, the disease will fade out. So in, in, for measles, if the disease lands in a population that's less than 200,000 to 500,000 people, it will just fade out. On the other hand, if it lands in a large population, it always finds new susceptible hosts in the form of newborn children. And the way that plays out is that these diseases such as measles undergo oscillations. So there'll be an epidemic. Many of the children will get the disease. The number of susceptible hosts will fall and then the epidemic falls. As the new susceptible people increase, they reach a threshold and then the disease comes back again. So you have these oscillations of disease that occurred almost every two years until there was a vaccine. Once there was a vaccine, then of course the incidence of disease went down to almost nothing. And we realized that the vaccine wasn't entirely effective until there was two doses given. And so after two doses, of measles was essentially uh, died out in the Western hemisphere. As an example of this, London uh, did not have a self-sustaining population until the 20th century. There was so much disease, the only way that London kept its uh, population up was by immigration. Now, where are we today with the COVID virus? Um, where we are today is that we have many potential interactions, but because of social distancing, we don't realize that contact. And so we have a very small number of people in the world who have been infected with the virus. Without that social distancing and these contacts realized, then of course the virus can spread. So currently there are, I don't know, something like uh, three and a half million confirmed cases of the, of the COVID virus in the world, but that's out of a total population in the world of 7.8 billion. So much less than 0.1% of the population has been, has contacted the virus. And so we still have a huge number of people who are susceptible hosts and could potentially spark an epidemic at any time. So let me delve into the cause of this a little bit more. You've probably all heard of the basic reproduction number or R0. And that represents the number of people who can be infected by one sick individual sick in the terms of disease. And for measles, which is the most contagious virus we've ever known, it's calculated that one sick individual can infect 16 other people in a large modern population in which everybody is susceptible. And smallpox was a little bit less, maybe an R0 of six and rubella about the same. So what about COVID-19? The disease caused by the SARS-CoV-2 virus, it's about 2.5, which was the calculation from Wuhan. So in the presence of social distancing at an amount of about uh, 75%, the calculation is that one person over 30 days could give rise to uh, only two and a half people infected. But if social distancing is reduced by only 50%, it goes up markedly. That is, one person over 30 days 
is calculated to be able to give rise to 15 infected people. Now, what if we stop social distancing altogether? Well, the calculation is that over 30 days, one person could give rise to over 400 infected people. And this is what was going on at the initiation of the disease, in which we didn't realize there was an epidemic. The people were um, asymptomatic for the most part and still um, intermingling, and the disease rose in, at an exponential rate. Now, after we've initiated social distancing, the disease is only increasing linearly, which reflects the amount of social distancing we have. Now, recently, the uh, University of Pennsylvania Wharton School of Business has a model and they released the results of that model. And that showed that if we partially opened the economy before June, that we would save uh, 4 million jobs, at a, but at a cost of 45,000 additional deaths by June. And they calculated that a full opening of the economy would save 18 million jobs, but at a cost of 230,000 additional deaths before June. So this becomes an issue for um, societal uh, ethics and not so much for biology. So where are we now? Well, we, as I said, most people in the world are still susceptible. We, are, we haven't changed anything in terms of the epidemiology of the virus. There is a huge density of people who can be infected at any time. We have some people who have recovered from the disease. These are, we hope to be the immune hosts. We don't really know that they're immune, but we assume that they have at least uh, some immunity. And then we have very small numbers of infected people. Where we wanna get to is this, where we have a very large number of people who are immune and these people actually protect all those who are still susceptible by a concept known as herd immunity. Herd immunity just means that the density of susceptible individuals is very small. So how can we get there? Well, of course, the best way to get there is an effective vaccine that we can administer to most people in the world. The only other way that we would get, we think that we could get to this point is just a years long epidemic. As I showed you for past epidemics throughout human history, they can last years or decades or even centuries. And of course, this would result in the deaths of millions and millions of people, probably is unacceptable to most of us. So that's what I wanted to tell you in the, at the first part of this talk about how human beings are, um, the most diseased species on earth and how epidemics are inevitable and how we might think about um, our ability to contain the epidemic. The next part I wanna talk about is the COVID disease itself. And there are several unusual features for this uh, COVID disease. And one of them is that the severity of the disease is correlated with age. So I plotted the the cases and the deaths and the fatality rate from the data provided by the uh, Chinese Centers for Disease Control. And what you can, and I plotted it versus age category. And what you can see is that there is a nice normal curve for the age distribution of cases. The deaths seem to go up with uh, age, but the fatality rate goes up directly proportional to age. And it's consistent and it goes up constantly from uh, a young age all the way up to the largest, the, the oldest people. Now, the reason that seems to be unusual is that for other respiratory diseases like influenza, the um, youngest children and the oldest adults are the most severely affected. A second thing that's somewhat unusual in this disease is that the death rate and incidence of disease do not necessarily correlate with population. The largest incidence of disease has been in the United States. And we don't have nearly the density of population found in other places in the world. For instance, the Indian subcontinent has 1.3 billion people. And, and as of May 10th, they had only recorded 2,200 deaths. The uh, continent of Africa is about 1.2 billion people. And their uh, recording of deaths has been low as well. So there seems to be something a little bit different uh, that may not be explained simply based on where the virus landed and the, and the density of the population. 
A third part of this that seems to be a little bit unusual is that there's a huge disparity of the disease where seemingly healthy adults can experience symptoms that range from undetectable to fatal. So this disease has uh, three phases or potentially has three phases. The early phase, uh, stage one is a viral response phase. And in that phase, people experience only mild symptoms. That can lead to stage two, which might uh, lead them to the hospital where they, they experience more disease. All through this, except for the very first few days, these people are highly contagious. And then there's a third phase in which they go into a hyperinflammatory phase and they can very rapidly uh, succumb to uh, bilateral pneumonia. And here's a quote from the uh, chief of infectious diseases at Mass General Hospital. A lot of young uh, patients without comorbidities get very sick. One day they uh, are okay and the next day they require intubation. And finally, the fourth is that there seems to be an association between disease severity and metabolic dysfunction, but not immunosuppression. So uh, unusually, the people that are, this, this is a plot of the people that are arriving in the hospital after having contracted the virus. And they seem to be overrepresented in uh, comorbidities that include cardiovascular disease, hypertension, metabolic disease, and obesity, but interestingly not by immunosuppression or chronic lung disease or asthma. This is not what one would expect, for instance, for influenza, which is another respiratory disease. So with these sort of unusual features, I want to propose a hypothesis for you today. And the hypothesis is that the severity of the COVID-19 disease is determined by something called antibody-dependent enhancement, ADE. So what does that mean? Well, the virus, which is represented up here, is um, initially contacts its receptor, which is the angiotensin 1 converting enzyme 2, ACE2. That um, virus then is taken up within the cell, uh, replicated, and then makes lots of tiny new baby viruses. They're actually not tiny. They're exactly the same size as the adult virus. Now, at the same time, your body makes antibodies. And what these antibodies can do for you is that they can block, they can bind to the virus and block, literally and physically block the ability of the virus to bind to its receptor. And that prevents uptake by the virus into the cells, which of course prevents uh, replication of the virus. But sometimes antibodies don't perform in this manner. Sometimes they have a different effect which is when you have a suboptimal antibody response, and it can lead to something called antibody-dependent enhancement. So under these circumstances, the antibody still binds to the virus, but poorly, perhaps, or at, at not such high affinity, the virus still binds to its receptor and produces baby viruses. But then there's another effect. The antibody can bind to the virus, and then through the binding of the back end of this antibody to another family of receptors called FC gamma receptors that are present on cells of your immune system, the antibody can literally pull the virus into the cells of the immune system. And these cells will now start replicating virus themselves. So that increases the amount of virus replication. But there's another effect. These receptors can also signal these cells of the immune system to produce inflammatory mediators, which can cause a hyperinflammatory response later in the disease. So where do these antibodies come from? Well, the antibodies might pre-exist due to a previous coronavirus infection, or the antibody might be produced in response to the SARS-CoV-2 infection. So why would we make a suboptimal or a weak antibody response that could lead to this antibody-dependent uh, enhancement? Well, one reason is that we've encountered a weekly cross, we've made a weekly cross-reactive antibody response by a previous encounter with a coronavirus that causes seasonal cold symptoms. So there are four of these viruses that circulate in the human population. And we know from laboratory tests that the antibody produced to these viruses can cross-react to a certain extent with the uh, COVID-19 virus. Additionally, 
older individuals generally make an inferior antibody response. So that's why when you go to get a seasonal flu shot, if you are over the age of about 65, you get a dose that's five times higher than that given to younger people. So how would this explain the virulence and spread of the SARS-CoV-2? Well, seasonal coronaviruses may not circulate everywhere in the world at the same rate. In any given population, some people have been previously infected by a seasonal coronavirus and some have not. And it may be that getting one or uh, more of these coronaviruses gives rise to an antibody response, which then causes the antibody-dependent enhancement. For reasons of medical conditions, some people make a poor antibody response. For instance, metabolic changes make a huge difference in the outcome of a viral infection. B cells, which are the source of antibodies in obese individuals, are hyperstimulated, inflammatory, and function suboptimally. And in obese mice and human beings, B cells function abnormally to make pathogenic antibodies. And finally, antibody-dependent enhancement can stimulate myeloid cells, monocytes, macrophages, and dendritic cells to make inflammatory cytokines that could be one source of the deadly cytokine storm. So what are the implications of this? Well, releasing a vaccine that promotes antibody-dependent enhancement would cause a disastrous increase in COVID-19 mortality. So rushing to release a vaccine before we know its safety is probably not a good idea. Vaccine-mediated protection could turn into vaccine-mediated antibody-dependent enhancement. So we think that the immune response, the antibody response to coronaviruses in general are not long-lasting. So as they wane, it's possible that this could turn into an antibody-dependent enhancement. Thirdly, a vaccine that works for young, non-obese people might be dangerous for elderly or metabolically compromised people. And finally, a vaccine efficiency or safety might depend upon previous coronavirus exposure. So what is my take on the epidemic? First of all, epidemics are inevitable given our rapid development of civilization. Um, many people have warned about the dangers of a zoonotic epidemic. And if we had responded to this COVID epidemic the way we responded to Ebola in West Africa, we may have prevented much of this virus spread, saved many, many lives. We are connected as human beings, not only by heredity or culture, but by a common biological susceptibility to infectious disease. And here I'm putting in a, a plug for an article I wrote for the Journal of Pediatrics on the imperative to vaccinate. I took five years writing that, so uh, ha have a look if you're interested. A third issue is that this is a biological problem, and it's going to require a biological solution. This was a point made by an NPR reporter recently, and that is that people were already social distancing before there was a mandate from our leaders. And they probably won't be in a hurry to go back to stadiums and restaurants at, at high rates until there is a biological solution to this biological problem. And lastly, I think we could benefit from science-based guidelines on social distancing. So I've put up a, a hypothetical relationship here between virus spread and social distancing. This happens to be a, a truncated power law uh, curve. And what it shows is that for a very little degree of social distancing, you get a very large amount, uh, you decrease virus spread by a large amount. In this case, 20% of the social distancing could give you as much as 80% of the uh, decrease in viral spread. And the other thing about this is that in, in this kind of a nonlinear relationship, oftentimes there is a, um, a sweet spot where past that sweet spot, um, the amount of benefit you get from increasing, for instance, in this case, social distancing is very little. Now, I don't know that this is the case at all, but what we could use are guidelines from people who can model the disease spread and the types of social distancing that we can um, practice in order to bring online the economy a little bit um, and yet not cause uh, tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of new deaths. So that's what I wanted to talk about today. Um, and I'd be 
more than happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. So that was incredibly, I'm not incredibly informative. I'm not sure it's reassuring, but um, I do thank you so much. Um, we do have several questions. A couple of them have to do with um, um, the antibodies you were talking about. If COVID-19 antibody responses are short-lived one or two years, as some researchers are suggesting, what is the impact on this pandemic? Well, it, if that's true for a vaccine, it may be that we just need to have a um, periodic revaccination. Re um, if, if we don't have a vaccine, then it, it, it's hard to predict. If, it's a, if you're immune for two years and then immunity wanes, then I suppose this uh, virus would continue in the population for a very long period of time. It may continue in the population anyway, but um, it, uh, it will make it a little bit more difficult to control the spread if the, if the uh, <clears throat> immunity is not um, permanent. Um, as with uh, dengue, could multiple serotypes of COVID-19 also result in ADE? Yes, that's sort of the implication <clears throat> that I was uh, trying to get across, and that is that other forms of coronavirus that are seasonal forms of coronavirus could induce an antibody response that gives you this antibody-dependent enhancement. Um, so yes, indeed, that's that dengue is the prototype for this, and this may be a manifestation of that. So why didn't SARS produce a pandemic? Um, that's an interesting question, of course. Um, and it, it probably has a difference in the, <clears throat> the, the, the prophase or the, the time before someone is um, infectious to the time they experience symptoms. It might be that it's, it's not quite as, uh, as um, infectious, that it requires direct contact. Any of the, the types of, of issues that go into the spread of a virus are probably subtly different or enough different such that we were able to contain the <clears throat> SARS virus by uh, identifying those uh, infected and then identifying everyone they come in contact with. The problem with this virus is that it's infectious way before anyone knows that they're um, uh, sick. And so there are so many infected people, it's very difficult to do a tracing. But I, I did read that <clears throat> United Kingdom is hoping to test virtually everybody and trace every single uh, contact from an infected person. So people are gonna try to do that, but it, it seems like it's much more difficult for this virus than it was for SARS. Um, going back to the antibody question, are antibody tests pretty reliable? Uh, that depends what you mean by reliable. Um, so there's definitely a cross reaction between uh, different coronaviruses, and it depends upon exactly how the uh, serology test is produced um, as to whether there'll be a, a demonstrable cross-reaction. So if you have a cross-reaction with a previous uh, sorry, uh, coronavirus encounter, that could cause a false, false positive. Um, and then if the test is just not working quite right, then you can have false negatives. I don't actually know what the, there are so many antibody tests out on the market right now that are not FDA approved. It's hard to say for each one what their effectiveness is or what their accuracy is. Um, there's a lot of questions coming up about ADE. What is its cause? Um, um, uh, what research is being done on your hypothesis? Uh, can you give us a few minutes on a little deeper dive? Well, in order to actually test that hypothesis. We would have to have serological tests that could delineate <clears throat> each of these different viruses, all four coronaviruses, and, and differentiate those, the antibodies specific for those, from the antibodies specific for the COVID-2. And we don't have those kind of specific um, antibody tests at the moment. And they're a little bit difficult and expensive to, um, to produce. People are more interested in working on vaccines and so forth right now. Um, I don't think I mentioned it, but when people tried to make a vaccine to, the, to SARS back in 2003, 2005, they did 
uh, record some uh, antibody dependent enhancement. So this is what's led some people to really uh, be aware of uh, ADE in this, in this particular uh, virus. So what's being done, um, not much that I know of until we would have very, very specific serological tests. Hey. Um, okay, so let's go back to the vaccine issue a little bit. We we know that some people are, are uh, very hopeful that there will be a vaccine in early 2021. Um, you touched on this a little bit um, in the talk, but what are your thoughts about safety and uh, efficacy? Well, so everyone probably saw that there was a, a nice results um, for this uh, novel sort of RNA vaccine that, that um, were were not published last night, but they were announced last night. Mm -hmm. And um, that was for eight individuals, but I think that was out of a group of 40-some uh, individuals that were tested. And since this is not a published report, we don't have all, we don't have any of the data, we don't really know what this means yet. Mm -hmm. and, and this highlights an issue, and that is that before we should release a vaccine or get too excited, it really needs to be tested on a large number of people with the, um, the understanding that we might see this ADE, we might see other side effects. And, uh, and so it, I hate to be negative about this, but we really need to test these things carefully because they can, they have the potential to do more harm than good. So, um on that announcement, I know that I think I read originally there were 30 people who volunteered to be vaccinated. The, re, the, the What got out was about six people. Does that sort of have any clue about um, anything regarding that study? Well, I think everybody wants to know what happened to the other people. So eight people <laughs> made antibodies. That's good news. But what about the other people? And we don't know. We just don't know. And I, I don't know that they're holding anything back. It might be those are the only ones they really tested so far. I just don't know. But I would say that there are uh, at least 78 different projects going around, going on worldwide to test different kinds of vaccines using old standard technology and using this more novel technology of, of using uh, RNA and DNA encapsulated in uh, lipid, lipid nanoparticles. Um, so I'm confident that we're going to have some form of an effective vaccine by 2021. Um, it may not be long lasting. You might have to have be re-vaccinated. You might have to have two or three doses, but there are so many different efforts going on. Um, I'm pretty sure that we're going to have something. It, the, the time frame though is really difficult to know. And as probably everyone has heard, vaccines usually take five or 10 years to develop. And so even if we get one within a year or 18 months, that's going to be the world record for the development of a vaccine. Mm -hmm. um, there's um, uh, Kawasaki's disease, which is sort of a, a, a variant of showing up in kids who some test positive for COVID-19. Um, does that have any um, relation to the ADE or any of the, the other things you spoke about? Um, so the Kawasaki-like syndrome that kids are coming down with rarely um, is really not understood. The Kawasaki disease itself is not understood. It's thought to be some sort of an autoimmune disease or hyperinflammatory disease. Why this virus should give rise to that um, is unknown, although there was evidence of it in the original SARS um, epidemic. So this might be something that comes up with these epidemics, uh, coronaviruses, but Honestly, nothing is understood about it. Okay, so to go to the future, let's go to the future a little bit. Um, for effective uh, testing and tracing, how often would people need to be tested before we get to that vaccine? Oh gosh. You mean the whole population or how, how are you phrasing that? How often do people need to be tested? So, so UCSD is hoping to return to learn next year, and they will have um, a population of forty thousand people. And they're trying, they're 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 suggesting that they might need to teach uh, test everybody monthly. Is that the scale? Uh, once every thirty days for forty, a population of forty thousand. Um, is there any modeling going on to predict this? 
Yeah, so I, that would just require um, some sort of quantitative modeling. I mean, you can imagine, of course, if they only test once a month, you have the possibility of, being, of contracting the virus and spreading it before you're tested again. Um, I mean, the only way you could combat that would be to test people you know, every four or five days, and I think that's unreasonable. Uh, so I think, I don't know how they chose 30 days. I suspect it was more or less pulled out of a hat, but... Uh, <laughs> Maybe the number of, uh, of, of, of test kits they have, you know, and how fast they can generate them. <laughs> yes, and of course that's going to change with time. I mean, they'll be able to produce more and more test kits as, as time goes on. Um, maybe that's the, initial, that's the initial hope. But, you know, so far we've had very few cases on the campus, and so um, and it might be that it's perfectly fine to test every 30 days. And, and furthermore, I just got my instructions for my course in the fall, and it's going to be remotely remotely given. Mm. So many of the, most of the classes, I think of over 50 people are going to be remotely given on, on Zoom. Um, and then the, the classes that, where people can sort of stay away from each other, perhaps distance a little bit, they have to wear masks. Um, I think those will probably be the only ones that are given in person. Mm -hmm. So um, your talk centered on do, uh, data from China. Um, does that really make sense for us to be modeling based on that, given the small number of cases they had? When, who, who and when will we be generating our own models based on the data that we have? Oh, we are. Uh, the, uh, one of the second studies I showed of people going into the hospital, that was actually from Georgia. Mm. I, I, I didn't mention that. But yeah, there's, there are lots of cases going on. But there weren't a small number of cases in China. There were tens of thousands of cases. So they have plenty of data. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I want to look to the future a little bit. I know that there was a report that um, uh, uh, coronaviruses were being studied in a lab in, uh, in China, in Wuhan, where the uh, outbreak began. Do we have any way to predict where the next pandemic will come? Where will the next uh, 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 virus jump from uh, original host to a, a human host? Well, the CDC uh, had, or and perhaps still has in a small way, um, group, a group of people who are epidemic hunters. And they would go all over the world, wherever there was an outbreak, and uh, they, would, they would test and they would look for the disease. And, and, and if there was something, they would mobilize the resources of the CDC quickly. There's a nice book that was, um, I'll just show you here. I just received it. I guess it's backwards, but it's written by That's Ali good. Khan, and he was a CDC uh, investigator, and he talks about how he would, wherever there would be an outbreak, whether it's Africa or Asia, he would uh, immediately dispatch a team that would, that would go and test. So um, that's what we need to do, because there will be more outbreaks, and we can potentially contain them the way we did SARS if we act very, very quickly. Um, I don't know that we could have contained this one. It's, it's, it has a different infectivity profile the way you were talking about. And so it may have gotten out anyway, but we may have been able to limit the outbreak if we had been on it a little bit more um, acutely. Mm -hmm. And in terms of, um, of immunity, do you, do you see that, the, do you see, what do you see as the immunity strength of the, of the people who have it already? I mean, we have maybe two different strains of this virus. Is there any difference between New York and California? And will either of them, how will they decide or how will they be able to assess what immunity these people have? There are different strains, but so far they're not different serologically as far as I know. So it, it seems that if you're immune to one, you're going to be immune to the other. The other thing to point out is that this is a relatively unusual, coronaviruses are relatively unusual for RNA viruses. RNA viruses typically have a very small genome and they, their replication is error prone. They make lots of mistakes in their replication. And so what you end up with is a huge number of mutant viruses at every replication stage in every single cell. The coronavirus is a little bit different. It's a much larger RNA virus and it has an error correction um, mod modality in its, rep in its replicates. So it doesn't make very many mutants very quickly. It's not to say it doesn't make any mutants, but it doesn't make very many. 
And so far, it looks like serologically they're the same. There's that you can find differences, but they they do look the same. One other thing that you touched on was the idea that it came from um, wh or where it came from and whether um, whether it was with the result of trying to identify new viruses in laboratories. And um, there have been several papers now that have been published, one of them in Nature, looking at the evolution of the coronavirus. And what they found was that, that the part of the virus that is responsible for binding to the ACE2 receptor is unique for this virus. It was, it's not really a sequence seen in any of the other coronaviruses. And yet, they've all bind to the same, or not the all, but SARS and this COVID-2 do bind to the same receptor. So um, one point that was made in this paper was that no person could have predicted this sequence and produced such a virus. It had to have been naturally evolved. How it evolved and where it evolved and whether it came from the live meat markets or whether it came, it was by some sort of other contact is, is unknown. So um, we have room time for maybe one or two more. Um, uh, what other factors besides antibodies and the convalescent plasma might be contributing to enhanced recovery from COVID-19? Well, my favorite topic is to study T cells and the way they um, they can kill off infected cells. And so usually in a viral infection, the uh, ability of the body to fight off the, the uh, disease comes from cytotoxic T cells that recognize a cell that's been infected and kills that cell. So that's typically how you clear a virus af uh, after infection. Um, but the, what confers immunity so that you never get the, the, vi the uh, virus is typically high affinity neutralizing antibodies. Virtually all the vaccines that we have and, and that work, uh, work via high, uh, um, high affinity neutralizing antibodies. Um, but, th but there are other parts of the immune system that play a role as well, and probably T cells have a big role. It's possible they may also play a role in preventing a new infection, but we just don't know yet. We just haven't done enough research on this. So, um Somebody asked if you would comment on the political response to this, but more importantly, what would have been a robust response to this pandemic? You know, I'm not really qualified to answer that. Um, a robust response would have looked like the, uh, the Ebola uh, response. So it, it broke out in West Africa. We immediately sent a, a large team from the CDC to not only train doctors and healthcare workers in, in uh, West Africa, um, but we sent lots of money. And then we monitored every single person that was coming back from West Africa to the United States. And two or three people did come back with the disease. And luckily we were able to contain it so there was never an outbreak. That would, that would be the sort of uh, response that we should have probably made in hindsight. But uh, I don't really want to delve into the politics. It's not my expertise at all. I think there's way too many comments out there, uh, opinions. And so it's one of these things that hopefully we'll look to scientists to help us find a better response in the future. Um, I think that's gonna be the last of our questions. Um, I really want to say thank you for this incredible presentation um, on, on the epidemiology and asking these questions. There were a couple more highly technical questions that I didn't get to. You can contact Dr. Hendrick directly if you really want those answers. And Dean Pagliano, thank you very much for your, your glowing introduction. It's really nice to know the incredible people we have here on campus. Um, I know you've all, well, maybe not enjoyed, but found very edifying today's colloquium and gathered some valuable knowledge in regards to the spread. Um, my thanks to our speakers and also to our donors for driving this level of research and innovation at UC San Diego. Without your dedication to philanthropy, we would not have people like Dr. Stephen Hedrick here to do this research. I wanna thank you for attending our first Chancellor's Associate virtual colloquium and uh, to know that we're gonna do another one very soon. Um, we really, 
thank you also for your support of Chancellor's Associates because everything you do helps students here on campus. And these are our future researchers, our future innovators. Um, and we wanna be able to do what we can now to keep them moving forward. I want you to stay healthy and well, and I hope to see you at our next virtual pull-up program on June 17th with climate scientist Kim Prather. So thank you very much, and um, thank you. And Kit, thank you so very much. Have a safe day and have a safe year.